What's up guys, welcome to Flatirons. Right now we're going through our series True Colors where we're tearing through all of Psalm 139. And on the weekend of April 1st, we have Easter services at all of our campuses. And if you're honest, we all have at least one friend that we want to invite, so take that step. And while you're scrolling through your phone aimlessly this week, be sure to follow us on all of our social media. We're so glad that you guys are here and that you're a part of Flatirons. All right, hey, what's up? How are we? We good? Yeah, good. You sprang forward. Good job. <laughs> Unless you think this is the 9 o'clock service, and then you're way off. Yeah, I'm glad you're here still. Um, hey, so I'm Ben. I'm the teaching pastor here, um, and I'm going to jump right in, because we are in week two of this series, True Colors. So if you missed last week or, or you need your memory refreshed, here's what we're doing throughout this entire series, True Colors. We're addressing this question. What does faith look like when life falls apart? What does faith look like when life falls apart? Because let's face it, when, when, when life is hard, when we are in the trenches of life, that's when our true colors show, right? That's when the real you comes out. Uh, any part of you that's been pretending to be something that you're not or pretending to believe something that you don't, all of that burns away when life gets hard. You, you're just, you don't have the time or energy or desire to pretend anymore. And whenever that happens, you eventually find out what you've actually put your faith in, what you've actually put your trust and your confidence in, and you're also left to discover whether or not the thing that you've put your faith in is strong enough to keep you fighting through the trenches. And, and throughout this whole entire series, we're going to be in Psalm 139. That's a poem. It's a prayer written by King David. That's the David and Goliath David. And we're in Psalm 139 because that psalm is a psalm for the trenches, that's what we looked at last week. And we may never know the exact historical moment that David wrote this psalm, but it would have been something like the battlefield, right? He, he would have, it would have been a context like in the middle of a battle that he was losing. This is a psalm written for the defeated by the defeated. And because of that, in Psalm 139, we get a little glimpse of what faith looks like when life falls apart, at least what it looked like for David, which is this. When you're in the trenches, faith becomes an intentional decision to continue placing your trust in God. It has nothing to do with how you feel and what you feel about God in the moment. It's an intentional decision. It's a choice. So when David is suffering through defeat and suffering through loss and when despair and fear and shame, anger, when they start to take root in David's heart, he hits pause and he goes for a walk and he intentionally flies his true colors. He raises the flag that represents his God and he puts his trust in that intentionally. He reassures himself of what is true about God even though it doesn't feel like it's true in the moment. And specifically, here's the truth that he's kind of reassuring himself of when it comes to God. He reassures himself that God knows everything and God is everywhere and God cares about us. So David intentionally chooses to speak that truth out loud to remind himself that God does know what he's going through. God is here with him on the battlefield and God does care about his suffering. He intentionally chooses, even in the midst of defeat, to continue marching into battle tomorrow with his trust still firmly planted in that God and in that truth. And honestly, for, for all of his faults, David was really wise because David knew something. David, so, so David was aware of something that oftentimes we aren't aware of. David knew that at the end of the day, in the midst of suffering, he only had two deals on the table. We say that all the time here. And so David knew this, he could either choose A, to continue placing his trust in God, or he could choose B, to begin believing that God has abandoned him. Or in other words, David knew that he had to choose between hope or despair, and David chose hope. And a lot of things have changed in the thousands of years that have gone by since David wrote Psalm 139, but those two deals on the table have not changed. Those are still the only two options for us in the midst of suffering. We can choose hope or we can choose despair. What do I mean by despair? What is it? What is it? it it's this. It's this thing that is born in the trenches when, when life is hard. So something terrible happens to us and then we begin wondering why God hasn't protected us and why hasn't he provided for us? And we start thinking to ourselves, we go, hey, wait a minute. So Jesus, I've kept up my end of the bargain. So where are you right now? We feel abandoned or forgotten by God. That's where despair is born. But despair takes over 
It consumes us whenever we take the feeling of being abandoned by God and we declare it to be true. That's when despair takes over. When we declare it to be true that bad things happen to good people because God is bad. He's toying with us. Or because God is weak, he was never powerful enough to help us in the first place. Or because God is uninterested, he just doesn't care about your suffering. And then a lot of us, either in the past or maybe you're here right now, we've declared that God was never real to begin with. Just a fairy tale, something humans came up with to feel better about themselves. And we ran those colors up the flagpole and we called them truth and we aligned ourselves to those beliefs. And when despair takes over, the results are devastating because we're, we're, we're naturally left to believe that we're out here on our own. Survival instincts kick in because of that because at that point, by necessity, you are forced to put all of your faith and all of your trust in yourself. Everyone else has let you down, including God. And so you take extra hours at work and you work yourself into the ground because you know, you know the world is cutthroat and who's gonna provide for you now? You have to do that. You have to do that for yourself. Or we do this, you you either become the most intimidating person in the room or you try to be the only person in the room. You isolate and sink into loneliness because you know that people are dangerous and the world is a cold place and who's gonna protect you anymore? You have to do that yourself now. And there's a thousand different ways that despair kind of plays out, but in the end, it always ends in one place we always end up discovering that we make terrible gods for ourselves. And when you can't trust yourself and you can't trust God, you are left with the dictionary definition of despair, which is this. Despair is a complete loss or absence of hope. It's hopelessness. And that's why hope, on the other hand, Hope is the remedy for despair. It's the antithesis, the opposite of despair because biblical hope is this. It's an expectant trust in God and his promises. So it's not hope in the, in the way we typically use the word where we go, I hope I get fill in the blank for Christmas, but you're not sure if you're going to get it or not. It's not wishing. Hope is confidence. Hope is this thing where despite our circumstances, even in in, in our worst suffering, the most difficult circumstances, we have such a deep confidence in the character and nature of God that we still expect his promises to come true for our life. And those are our two deals on the table in the midst of suffering, despair or hope. And if despair happens when we take this feeling of being abandoned by God and we declare it to be true, hope happens when we declare God to be true to his promises, even though we feel like he's abandoned us right now. And that's exactly what we see David doing in Psalm 139. He's fighting off despair by declaring hope. Here's how he does that. So In in the middle of this psalm, David reassures himself that God cares about us. We talked a little bit about that last week. God cares about us. And David doesn't just say it because it sounds nice. He also proves it. He backs it up with logic. And he says that God cares about us because God created us. Here's how David puts it. And it's beautifully written. He says this. He says, for you, and he's talking to God. He goes, for you created my inmost being. And you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. God created us. Now, here's what that doesn't mean. So that doesn't mean that God created the first two people, like Adam and Eve, and then the rest of us are just his offspring. So it doesn't mean that Adam and Eve were created by God, but you and I were just created by our parents, right? Who got a glass of wine and then... (laughs) Let's not think about that at church, or ever. That's not what it means. Instead, what David says, and this truth is all throughout the Bible, what it means is that we were each individually, uniquely created by God. God displayed his overwhelming power by bringing you, like specifically you, into being, out of nothingness. And he chose you to be made in his image, in his likeness. What David is is saying and what the whole Bible says is this, you were created on purpose, 
and you were created for a purpose. And maybe, you know, some of us, maybe we've been in church for too long, we've heard that too many times, but at the end of the day, that should still shake us up. It's an overwhelming truth. There's all these implications that follow if you believe it. So as an example, if you believe that to be true, here's what it means. It means that regardless of how many times you've looked in the mirror and you see nothing but a mistake, when God looks at you, he sees his creation, he sees his image and his likeness, and he sees your reason for being here. Or here's one that that hits close to home for me, at least, if you know my story. If you believe that to be true, it means that regardless of how many times you've thought to yourself, it would be better for everyone if I'd never been born. God thought to himself, it'd be better for everyone if you were. And so he said, let there be Ben. Now, there's probably some of us in the room today where it's like, just take that home with you today. Sit, sit in that for seven days. You're, you're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not a waste of space. You were created on purpose and for a purpose. But so David, he reminds himself that God is his creator, but why? Well, that's my question. Like, why does that help David fight off despair? And here's the reason why. It's because if we were created, then this must mean we have a creator who cares about us. Because whenever a creator creates... He cares about his creation. The best way that I can kind of sum this up, the closest parallel I have here is parenting, all right? Because it's just true that I like my kids and I like my kids way more than I like your kids, significantly more. That's just natural and that's good. I like my kids and I like them more because they're mine. I just have a deep, uh, special emotional connection with them. So much so that sometimes I even feel what they feel. And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's that thing where we, like, we feel actual joy in our hearts when they open up their birthday presents. And we feel actual pride in our hearts when they take their first steps or when they graduate from school. And then of course, on the other side of the spectrum, it's still true. We feel actual suffering in our hearts when we watch them suffer. The simplest example of this, kind of like if it's true in this case, then it's definitely true in cases of more deeper suffering. For example, I'll I'll never forget the time that Emery, that's my daughter, uh, she's four and a half, I'll, I'll never forget the time she first told me that one of her friends at school was being mean to her. And as a dad, it was my first experience with one of my kids kind of opening up to me and, and telling me something I didn't know about and explaining to me that their feelings were hurt. And she was trying to, so hard to be strong, like she was trying to be resolute, but her eyes are all watery anyway. She's so sad about it. And, and in that moment, as I'm in bed, laying in the top bunk with her and she's telling me the story, I feel actual sorrow, like actual, actual pain. I remember what that feels like in school. I felt actual suffering in my heart. And I'm not being overdramatic, I know, I'm dad. So I know that in the grander scheme of things, she's, she'll be just fine. She probably, she probably doesn't remember it now, you know? And, and I know, the, I'm dad, I know in the grander scheme of things, it's actually probably a good thing. She'll actually learn something from this experience. But in that moment, in the top bunk, I'm not really focused on any of those things. I'm really more just focused on M. Because Emery hurts right now. And when M hurts, dad hurts with her. And that's only because Emery is my daughter. That is like the the closest parallel I can think of to why David is reminding himself that God created us. Because if we are God's creations, then that must mean when we hurt, God hurts along with us. But... There's a follow-up question there. Like this talk is a good example of how argumentative I am when I read the Bible. I read something and I'm like, oh, that's good. And then immediately my brain is like, but hey, what about this? And I have a, like even if you believe that to be true and it sounds nice right now that God cares for us and he suffers with us, my immediate like follow-up question is this. So if God really does care about me, then why does he allow me to suffer in the first place? Like if I had the power to remove all suffering from Emery's life, would I do it? And David touches on this question in the very next verse, but it's a tricky verse. 
And so I wanna first tell you a story that I hope will, hopefully it'll help make sense of what David is getting at in this next verse. So a couple months ago, I was finally officially ordained. If you're unfamiliar with that, uh, ordination ceremony is a process where a person is officially decreed as a pastor or a minister, which is to me kind of funny because I've been leading and teaching here for years and I've not been a pastor. (laughs) So surprise. I think you have to burn all my old talk. You can't say you run good anymore. That was pre-Pastor Ben, so you can't say it. Um, But so yeah, in January, I had my ordination ceremony. And that's just the pastor's version of being sworn into the military or taking an oath of office or something like that. And the actual process of an ordination ceremony looks different depending on what church you're in, what part of the world you live in. But, but there's always one thing that happens at every single ordination ceremony under the sun. And that is the laying on of hands and the praying over of whoever is being ordained. If you've got no context for it, that sounds weird. So I'll explain what that looks like. So I had almost all of the important influential people in my life present at the ceremony. And at one point, they all kind of form a circle around me and Allie and our three kids and and they lay their hands on us. There's just hands everywhere. And and this is a symbol that they're right here with us, that, that me and my family, we're not walking into lifelong ministry on our own. We have support. We have people who have our backs. And then as they have their hands on us, they begin one by one praying over us and blessing my family. They ask God for strength and courage and protection and passion and with a real sense of heaviness and intentionality and seriousness, they confirm that God has set me apart for his church. This has been his plan all along. And at least for me, it was a powerful moment It probably didn't look like it to people, you know, like on the outside looking in, maybe not even to some of the people who were there, but for me, it was powerful. It's that moment that I can always look back on. And and when ministry is hard, when it's eating my family up, I can look back on that moment and go, okay, God ordained me for this. God set me apart for this and he's not dumb. He won't let me down. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try something. I want you to picture something like that for yourself in your head. Actually do it, imagine it. And I'm not talking about being a, a, becoming a pastor. What I want you to picture is, I want you to right now see their faces, the people that you trust most in this life. And I want you to imagine them surrounding you and they're gonna set you apart for something very important. And they're laying their hands on you as a sign of support and they're praying over you and blessing you and encouraging you. That would be powerful. And now I want you to keep that image in your mind as I read this next verse from Psalm 139 where David says this. He says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book, O God, before one of them came to be. So this image in your mind of all, all the people that you trust the most in your life, they're surrounding you, blessing you, supporting you, encouraging you. Replace those people with God himself And David says that that's what God has been doing with you every minute of your life. With a great, heavy, intentional seriousness, God has set apart every moment of your existence and he's decided to walk through every moment of your existence with you, hand on your shoulder, feeling joy when you feel joy, feeling sorrow when you feel sorrow. He at the same time has been strong enough to support you, but also vulnerable enough to suffer with you. David is saying that the God of the universe has laid his hands on, blessed, and set apart every moment of your life. Your days have been ordained. So Zach Weingartner, the the campus pastor here at Lafayette, he was doing a devotional this morning. He kind of summed up this concept really well. He said this, he goes, God doesn't just have a plan for the world and he doesn't just have a plan for his church, his community. He He doesn't even just have a plan for your life in the large abstract sense. He has a plan for today. He always has. He has a plan for this service. He has a plan for you when you get in the car and you leave. All of your days, every moment have been ordained by God himself. He's laid his hands on them and blessed them. 
But before you leave, here's what I know. I know that like some of us are on the other side of suffering, right? So we, we can look back at, at, at things we've walked through and it's, it's, we're able to kind of more quickly understand the hope that is in that truth. But I know that others of us are not on the other side of suffering. We're suffering right now. And we just lost babies and we lost jobs and marriages. We lost our hope. We've lost health. I know that's the case and that's why I've been nervous about this talk because I know, so I know that that one sentence on the screen, it will either fill you with hope to know that nothing has ever happened to you by mistake and you've never been alone through anything you've walked through. God has always been there with his hand on you. Hope to know that there's nothing difficult you've ever walked through that happened because God turned his back on you to go deal with more important things than you. I know that one sentence will either fill you with hope or it will make you furious. Because it does mean that God for some reason did not take away the terrible things that have happened to you. He didn't take them away. He ordained them. He allowed them to happen. He chose instead to get down into the trenches and suffer through it with you. And I know that when you are in the trenches, this truth that God laid his hands on, blessed and set apart the trenches for you, it doesn't make anything feel better right now. I know that. And I'm not saying that it should. I am saying this. If you're able to wrestle through all that anger and frustration and confusion with God, which we see David doing in Psalm 139, I promise there really is hope buried in that truth. Not not happiness, but hope. Let me explain that, because how can you how can you have hope without being happy about what what you're suffering through. And I think we can learn that by taking a look at what David does not do in the midst of his suffering. I'm trying to learn this. So first of all, David does not approach God and ask to feel any better or happier about his suffering. It's not possible. It's not possible for him to feel better about it. And let's be honest, we all have stuff that we've walked through that we may never feel happy about or thankful for. At least not unless God were to do something literally miraculous while healing us through that suffering. See, David doesn't ask God to feel any better or happier about his suffering because God doesn't ask you to feel any happier or better about your suffering. He's not telling you to get over it. Here's the other thing David doesn't do. David also doesn't ask for reasons or explanations. You know, like, God, why? What is the bigger plan here? What is the purpose? He doesn't ask for it. And again, that's so wise of David because when it comes to our deepest, most painful sufferings in this life, what we think we want is the answer to why. Why did this happen? But whenever we ask the question or attempt to answer, why did this happen to me? Or worse yet, when someone else tries to answer that for us, when they say things like, oh, years from now, you'll look back on this and be thankful for it and time heals all wounds. Whenever we try to answer ourselves or someone else tries to answer for us that question, it never feels better. There's honestly, there's no answer or reason or explanation that will make us feel better about our suffering. It's just true, it's a fruitless question. Even Jesus himself, he knew it was a fruitless question. There's this moment in Luke where Jesus is walking, he's got a big crowd with him and he's kind of listening in on their conversation and the crowd is discussing essentially the local news. All right, so one guy goes, hey, did you hear about all these Galileans who were murdered by the Romans? And this other guy chimes in and he goes, did you hear about that tower that fell over in that town next door? It crushed a bunch of people, killed all of them. And there was this common assumption in their day that tragedy only struck a person if a person was extremely and terribly sinful. So they had a view that suffering was a tool of punishment that God used. And they're obviously talking about the local news through that lens 
uh, uh, that idea of suffering. And so Jesus cuts him off. He interrupts him. And he says this. He goes, okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. So are you saying that you, do, like, do you really believe that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way, because they were murdered? Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Like, are you saying that you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? And so God pushed a tower over on them. And he goes, I tell you, no, no, that's not what's happening. And then he says this, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Here's what Jesus is saying. He goes, listen, that's not how God works. And that's not what your suffering is about. Jesus says, listen, sometimes people are murdered by the Romans because we live in a broken, sinful world and people are evil. And sometimes towers collapse because we live in an imperfect world where architects make mistakes and structures decay and weather destroys. And so Jesus says, listen, stop asking why. Stop, stop asking what, why, what's the point of my suffering? Stop asking why bad things happen to good people. It's a fruitless question. Instead, he says, here's something worth thinking about. You should think about repenting. And repenting means to stop and rethink the way that you think about God. So Jesus says, listen, you should stop and rethink the way you think about God and suffering. Because God is not on some golden throne in outer space waiting for you to screw up so that he can punish you with cancer. That's not what your suffering is about. Stop and rethink it and and then align your life with what you now know to be true about God. Jesus says repentance is more worth your time. Stopping and rethinking the way you think about suffering is more worth your time than looking for reasons for why you're suffering. See, Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that that people don't suffer because it's God's will. Your suffering is not God's will. It's not God's will in the sense that when God ordained all of your days, he made sure to definitely add that one terrible thing you've walked through. God does not make sinful things happen in your life. He's outside of sinfulness. He wouldn't, he can't make sinful things happen in your life. And he doesn't want us to suffer. Instead, it is God's will that as we walk through a life filled with the natural results and consequences of a sinful, broken world, it is God's will that he leverages all of your suffering. It's his will that no dead thing in your life stays dead. It's his will that no thing goes wasted. It is God's will that he leverages all of our suffering for the good of those who love him, even if you'll go to the grave, never understanding why that could have been good. That's Romans 8, 28. Paul wrote that. He says this, he says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. But even still, like if you, if you see that truth on the screen and you agree with it, you believe it's true. And even if you do what we're talking about in this series, you do what David d- did. You fly your true colors. You intentionally decide to place your hope and trust in that promise. Even still, it doesn't make your suffering any easier to handle and it's not supposed to. Jesus is the perfect example of this. Jesus is the, the, the one who he suffered the most and for the best reason. On a cross, he put to death all of our shame and guilt and deserved condemnation so that we could be family with God again. But even though Jesus knew why he was suffering, it didn't make his suffering any easier or it wouldn't be called suffering. In fact, right, like right before he's arrested, he goes to a garden with his friends in the evening to pray and he's gonna go off by himself to pray but before he does that, he has a moment where he turns to his friends and he opens up and he's honest with them and he says this, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Here's what Jesus does not say. He does not say, I know what God is gonna accomplish through me and through the cross, and so I have a really good outlook, and I'm really learning a lot through this suffering right now, and I'm excited about this. 
He doesn't say that. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. That is your God speaking. And then he does go off and he prays and while, he, while he's praying, he says this, he goes, my father, if it's possible, please may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And Jesus prays and basically he says this, he goes, God, if there is any other way to accomplish this mission, a way without all of this suffering, then please can we do that? But if there's not another way, then I still fly my true colors. I still intentionally decide to trust in your will for my life. And I will choose to trust that it's not your will for me to suffer in the sense that you want this to happen, that you've been excited about this. Instead, I trust that it's your will to bring life out of my death. I trust that it is your will to take all things, including this awful suffering, and leverage it somehow for my good and for the good of your people. See, what David and even Jesus himself found in the promises that God cares about us and God created us and God suffers with us and God has ordained our every moment. What David and Jesus found in that was hope. And what hope provides is this. Hope is the only foundation strong enough to keep us standing through suffering. With despair, there's no foundation. You can't stand on it. Because with despair, you're out here on your own. There's no one stronger than you to place your trust in. And so when you suffer, you assume that you suffer because you are weak. Or you suffer because you didn't try hard enough. Or you suffer because you're a miserable waste of space. And when you do suffer, all of your suffering is pointless because there is no God more powerful than you who cares about you. And there's no God more powerful than you who can leverage all of your suffering. You're left to try to leverage your suffering for your own good and you can't do it. If you could, you wouldn't be suffering anymore. There's no foundation in despair. You can't stand on it for long, you'll die there. It's quicksand. But with hope, with hope, we have a foundation strong enough to stand on. And David knew that only on that foundation would he be able to march into battle again tomorrow. And even Jesus knew that only on that foundation would he be able to march toward the cross. And only on that foundation will we ever be able to march out of the trenches and into battle again tomorrow. It's just true. God knows what you don't need. And he knows what you don't need is for him to say, listen, toughen up or get over it or why are you still sad about this? Don't you know I work all things to the good of the people who love me? Like, why don't you see that? Why aren't you over it by now? And he knows that it won't help at all for reasons and explanations. Instead, what he knows is what we need when we're in the trenches is we need someone more powerful than enough, more powerful than us to support us. But if that's going to be the case, if that's going to happen, if someone's gonna put their arm around us and guide us through the trenches, then that person needs to crawl down into our suffering and suffer with us. And God has done that for us. Jesus crawled down to this earth to suffer with us and to suffer for us and he continues to crawl into the trenches and suffer with us. What we need when we're in the trenches is hope, an expectant, confident trust in God and his promises, specifically the promise that he will continue to crawl down into our trenches and suffer with us. It is the only foundation strong enough to support you. Now, that's really all I can say about hope or despair today. Or, there's so much more to be said about it. It's all I can say today and have the time to do it justice. And so I've been nervous about that. Because I know, like, 
I've been so nervous about this whole, you know, sharing the truth that God has ordained every moment of your life. He's let these things happen to you. He's decided to crawl into suffering with you because I know that it's difficult truth. I know it's not really what we want to hear right now. And I've been nervous about it because I've been nervous about leaving us here with that truth and then hoping that you can kind of wrestle through that for seven days and then come back in here next week so we can pick it back up and keep talking about it and hopefully, hopefully answer some of the questions that you, that you have that are new after this talk. I've been really nervous about it, but here's the reason I'm leaving us here anyway. And here's the reason that I, I confidently believe it is exactly the truth that God wants to share with us to, today despite its difficulty and despite its mystery. It's because of something crazy that happened to me on Monday. So on Monday, I'm sitting in Starbucks. It's this little, you know, lesser known hipster coffee joint. You've probably never heard of it. Um, I'm sitting in Starbucks and I'm studying for this talk, I'm outlining this talk and I feel so discouraged for all the reasons I just told you. I know it's true, I, but I know it's difficult and I know it's not what we think we need to hear in the moment. And I've been staring at Romans 8, 28, the whole all things work together for the good of those who love him verse. I've been staring at it for the longest time, just discouraged. I've been trying to figure out how to pivot, honestly. Like, how, can I teach anything else? Can I teach something other than this? So discouraged. I'm starting to chicken out. But that's when this guy from Spain, he's from Spain, he's probably in his 60s or 70s, he's been sitting at the table in front of me the whole time. He gets up, he motions to me, I take out my headphones, he asks if I can watch his stuff at the table while he goes to the bathroom. I say, yeah, sure. He leaves, he comes back a few minutes later and says, thank you, and as he does, he sees my Bible, it's been out on the table, and he goes, do you read the Bible? And I say, yeah. And he goes, do you follow Jesus? And I say, yeah, yeah, I follow Jesus. And he goes, oh, I, I first started following Jesus in 1977 and he changed my life. And then I start telling him that I'm a pastor. I'm like, I'm a pastor at Flatirons. I'm working on my sermon right now. And he waves for me to stop talking. <laughs> um, and I stop and he points to his ear and he's got a like, device in his ear. And he explains to me in very, very broken English, he explains that he went almost completely deaf years ago. And because English is his second language, he can speak it decently to other people. But he can't hear well enough to understand it when other people speak English to him. And so he explains to me that I, I got to either speak perfect, fluent Castellano Spanish or I have to write in English. And so I'm like, I grab my pen and my journal and I write that I'm a pastor and that I'm working on my sermon. Which side note, when I write that, he looks down and he, he reads it and he goes, ah, oh, and here I am thinking you are in youth group. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I had a good laugh. <laughs> But then, and here's the reason I'm telling the story in the first place. So, something insane happened, and I'm honestly like, I'm still reeling from it. So this guy, he just starts talking, like a mile a minute. And he starts telling me his entire life story for some reason. And here's what he said, and you have to remember, he has no idea what I'm studying, what I'm discouraged about, what I'm supposed to teach on this weekend. He's got no idea. So he starts talking and he starts telling me his life story and here's what he said, I'm gonna paraphrase this part. He says, yeah, I lost my hearing years and years ago and I was so depressed about it that I nearly killed myself. But the only reason I'm still here is because of Jesus. And then he says this, he says, the only reason I'm still here is because I know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, including me. And my jaw starts to drop. He just quoted Romans 8.28 to me. This is the verse I've been staring at in, in discouragement for half an hour now. And then it gets even crazier because he doesn't stop. He keeps talking and then he says this, and this is a direct quote because the second we were done talking, I wrote all of this down. It was too powerful. This is a direct quote from him. He says, I still don't know what good will come from losing my hearing, but I love that verse, not because it makes me any happier, but because through Jesus, on that verse I am made to stand. And on that verse I stand taller and taller every day. And I was floored. 
everything he just said. It was in my sermon notes, on my computer. And so this time it's my turn and I'm like, stop. And I, you know, I grab my, I'm writing as quickly as I can. I'm trying to explain to him that he just spoke my sermon notes out loud to me. And I don't know, I don't know if he didn't understand or if maybe I wrote so fast that it was illegible, but he looked down and he read it and he goes, ah, I also coach soccer for the youth. And then he talked about soccer. (laughs) (laughs) And meanwhile, my mind is totally blown. And I'm like, I don't think he gets it. But we talk for a few more minutes and that's that. His name is Sergio. We've been texting back and forth and hopefully I'm gonna get coffee with him next week. I'm gonna take a second attempt at explaining to him how crazy that was. But here's why I tell the story. It's because of this, in that brief conversation with Sergio, it was like God reassured me of this truth. This truth that somehow all of our days have been ordained by God, including all of the terrible stuff. And somehow at the same time, God has never stopped being good and perfect and he's never stopped having full control of your life. And it's like you reassured me of this truth that he's crawled down into these trenches to suffer with us. And he's done that because he cares about us and he cares about us because he created us. And most importantly, it's like God reassured me that even though this truth is difficult and even though it might not ever make us feel happier about or thankful for our suffering, at the same time, in a way that I just can't quite explain to you, and neither can David and neither can Sergio, it's this truth that forms our only hope. It is our only foundation strong enough to keep us standing through suffering. And so here's what I want to do. To to wrap this up today, I'm going to ask that you stand up with me right now. And here's what I'm going to do. I was going to teach on this at the end of the talk, but I'm not. I'm just going to read it to you. I'm going to read the section of Romans that saved Sergio's life. And it still has the power to save our lives. And to quote Sergio, this this truth in Romans that we're about to read, on this truth we can stand and on this truth we can be made to stand taller and taller every single day. I can't explain to you how it is we stand taller on this truth. All I can say is that I have. And so I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes. Feel your feet on the ground firmly planted. You're standing today. You've been suffering. You've been walking through the trenches, but you're standing right now. And that's because we have a God who's crawled into these trenches with you and he's suffered with you. He's kept you standing. But on this truth that I'm about to read out loud, we can be made to stand taller and taller and taller every single day of our lives. This is Romans 8. And this is our prayer today. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. In all things, God works for the good of those who have been called according to his purpose. What then shall we say in response to this? How do we respond to that? And here's how we respond to that is this. If God is for us, who can possibly be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with Jesus himself, graciously give us all the things, all the things we actually need to survive the trenches? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Seriously, what can separate us from that? Shall trouble, shall hardship, Shall persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, can any of those things separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all of these things, in all of these trenches, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels 
neither angels nor demons, neither your present, your past, or your future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God, help us to feel that we're standing right now still only because of you and help us to stand taller and taller on that truth. And we pray that in your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen.